thank you so much for joining us for our series of virtual in conversation events we are incredibly grateful to all of the creatives and artists who shared their time their wisdom and their experience with us it's easy to ask in the face of a global pandemic why do the arts matter but the truth is that theatre is as old as civilization itself it's a place where we learn we explore and we share our common humanity it's a pressure valve for society, a safe space in which to explore dangerous ideas. And above all, it's entertaining. At Dark Unicorn Productions, we rely very heavily on the support of our wonderful patrons to continue our work. You can join them and become a patron of the arts yourself by joining our scheme, which starts at just £50 per year to become a Rainbow Unicorn. Be part of the Dark Unicorn family. Be part of the recovery and the future of theatre. Don't let the lights go out. Become a patron today. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Dark Unicorn In Conversation. My guest today has an impressive track record as a writer, director, actor and chameleonic voiceover artist and yet is probably known to the widest audience as Simon Atmore, the homophobic thug who murdered Paul Coker, the boyfriend of Ben Mitchell, in EastEnders. Nevertheless, his is an impressive CV ranging from sketch comedy on stage and on TV with his lifelong best friend, writing partner and former Dark Unicorn and Conversation guest Tom Sturton, and his name totally Tom, to a panoply of writing credits. Most recently these have included Man of the Hour, a richly glossy short film which swept up an award at the Cannes Film Festival and can be viewed on Amazon Prime, and All My Friends Hate Me, a feature film starring Sturton and which, at the time of recording, was in post-production. He is Tom Palmer, and we started, as so often we do, by chatting about his early life. Tom, when did you fall in love with entertaining? Um, well, I mean, I think probably as a teenager, myself and my my best friend, who's... Now my co-writer, I think we spent a lot of time at parties trying to kind of make people laugh. Um, we spent a lot of our spare time trying to make very ambitious action films with a video recorder, um, which I'm sure would be hilarious to rewatch now. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, I think that was sort of, sort of the sort of slightly narcissistic self-interested part of me was just wanted people to kind of laugh and uh you know i wanted to i guess i wanted to entertain in in some respect um but in terms of performing itself i mean it was probably probably at school when i kind of got a bit of a buzz of you know playing someone else and having that kind of hour and a half or whatever of, of a captivated audience and living off their claps and their laughter and kind of the buzz and the adrenaline that you get from that um and i think that's kind of still with me even though i do a lot more writing and producing now and i haven't performed on the stage for a long time but i i still every time i watch something i get that kind of urge to get up on stage and try and steal someone's applause and soak up some of some of the energy in, in the room and I mean, which came first for you? Was it writing or performing? Um, well, as I say, because it, because I, it all started really kind of dicking around with a camera and um, uh, making kind of sketches and filming them and kind of, I don't know, doing impersonations of Ali G and stuff. I feel like it was the writing and the performing were kind of one and the same thing. It was all about kind of how can we create some entertainment um and then uh, it it felt like the most natural thing was to just kind of take that 
drive and put it all into acting. I wanted to go to drama school. I wanted to do the kind of RSC theatre thing. That was my my dream. Um, but instead, ended up going to university, and um, and I think it was probably there that I got more officially into into the writing side of things and into certainly writing sketches um, and uh, and then initially making this kind of mockumentary thing with my friend and um, putting it up on a little known site at the time called YouTube um, and uh, and having no idea what, what would happen or what the site was even for um, and then that really kind of started the whole comedy writing performing um, element of my career um, and then it was Edinburgh Festival and, and so on. Um, Sad viral video, was that, that was High Renaissance Man, was it? was it? High Renaissance Man, um, yeah, Tom and I wrote it in our last year of university. Um, we had seen some quite kind of funny, um, uh, piss-takeable characters at our universities and we just wanted to, <laughs> to kind of pay them respect by making a little documentary about them. Uh, and so we created this character who, um, yeah, who puts on a disastrous club night that fails. And we sort of filmed it like it was a sort of BBC fly on the wall documentary. I always say that living with James is a bit like watching the bridge over the River Kwai. Your dad says you gotta do it. You've been out, you've paid for it. You've even bought the Blu-ray. But ultimately you'd rather be watching Beowulf, or anything else. Come on in through to what I guess we would call the um, kitchen area. Uh, as you can see, we like to keep it clean. Not. This is actually fine. Um, I suppose we're a bit like kind of Whitney and I. Uh, we want the finest cakes and wine, and we want them now. The dishwasher's broken. He hasn't seen Whitney there and there. Yes, I have. Yeah, but not as many times as me. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. My life at Bristol is by no means confined to these four walls. The devil makes work for idle hands, and uh, you're looking at the hands that won the Northwest Berkshire Archery Trials, so. I keep myself busy with the three Ps. Pills, pussy, and pizza. And I'm grade 10 at all three. Um, and, uh, and in the process had to learn a lot about filmmaking and sort of how you film stuff, how you cut stuff together, how the sound works, all this kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's a very kind of shaky first stab at, at a film. But um, I think we learned so much doing it that way. Um, and as I say, we, we intended to screen it to some friends and people that were coming to watch a few sketches that we were doing in the top of a pub in Oxford. So we did, we projected it, a few people watched it and then yeah this friend of ours was just like you should you should put it on YouTube and he uh he uploaded it for us and then suddenly it kind of I think because it was university based and because um it had a kind of niche target audience it suddenly started getting shared around the universities. Um, and then from there our uh, future agents saw it and said you know can we have a meeting and do you want to go up to the Edinburgh Festival and, and that's how things all started for us um, so had it not been for that I think I still would have after university I would have wanted to go to drama school and and try and crack into the industry that way but um, but in the end yeah I didn't I didn't feel I needed to after that which was which was nice um, having said that you know I think for a long time when I was an actor I, I did it did feel very insecure about not having trained um, and not having had that kind of formal grounding in, in um, you know, uh, speech training and poise and posture and all that kind of stuff. Um, so there was a stage in my career when I really did my best to try and get into acting classes sort of on the side of everything else I was doing and, um, and kind of try and like work up all the stuff that I think drama school does give you that kind of poise and confidence and and I think it gives casting directors a lot of reassurance that if they are going to cast you in a play you know you're not going to be the one that 
loses your voice in two weeks time or, or whatever. Um, and I think sometimes, I guess I felt that um, uh, awareness that I was from the comedy world when I was trying to be in straight theatre shows. Um, uh, not that there was a kind of snootiness about it, but it was just kind of, I just sensed it was a, they were less at ease with, with my background and where I was coming from. And, um, and I guess my intention for, for how I was going to play the roles and how I was going to handle a long run and stuff. Um, but, uh, but luckily in the end, I did get in a few, in a few shows and I'm, I'm really glad that, um, I'm really glad that I did have that brief kind of, um, yeah. So, um, uh, so yeah, I had a brief time doing, doing some theatre shows and, and I loved it. Um, but just, I found over the past whatever, whatever it's been ten years since I've been kind of professionally working, and I found the one rule of thumb is just that any time there's been a kind of trend going on in my career, and you know I was getting into theatre, so I thought, right, I'm going to be a stage actor. I love this. I love the rehearsals. I love the process. I love the buzz of being on stage. And as soon as I started thinking that and really focusing on on um, on theatre as my kind of as my calling, um, all the theatre auditions seemed to dry up. <laughs> I started doing, you know, uh, I don't know, bit parts on some sitcom or whatever. So I find, you know, I'm glad that I kind of, that I write and produce and act because I, I literally couldn't tell you what I'll be doing for some time next year. You've, you've talked um, already about your um, long-term collaboration with, with Tom Stone, mm. who is also featuring in this series. Um, You've, I mean, as totally Tom, you had the sketch shows, the you know, high Renee sometimes you mentioned, fronted up segments of a major BBC comedy series. Uh, there's been other um, sort of less obviously sort of sketch comedic work as well. You've known each other a very long time. Uh, well, you were at school together after all, but what is it about the chemistry of that relationship that makes it work for you? Um, good question. I don't know. I mean, I um, uh, well, I certainly feel that being best friends and knowing each other inside out does mean that there's um, certainly an efficiency to the way that you write. Because I think with a stranger, I would maybe take a little longer to broach the idea that what they'd written was maybe a bit crap uh, or was had maybe missed the point or whatever. Whereas I think we're comfortable enough with each other that we can slap down a bad idea very quickly no one gets offended and then you move on and equally you know we can work off the premise that like we both know we have the same sense of humor um we both uh believe it to be a sense of humor worth sharing and so if we both find something funny then it's totally worth writing um so i think that definitely works um as a as a basis for the for the writing setup um and then in terms of chemistry i think there's kind of you know we certainly fit easily into a sort of more, I mean, I tend to play more of the kind of straight man roles and Tom plays the more kind of deluded comedy roles. And I think that was something that was nice to kind of, once we fully recognized that kind of dynamic, it really made writing and performing a lot easier. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a traditional setup, um, not that all double acts, uh, have that 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 set up but um i think once we recognized that it was uh it felt a lot easier to kind of have that chemistry to fall back on so all the characters seem to kind of fall back on the sort of the deluded one and the kind of like slightly more together kind of like you know beleaguered one who's got to put up with this idiot in his workspace or in his whatever um and uh yeah, I think so. I think performance-wise, that dynamic um, is a kind of reassuring one. Um, and as I say, I think writing-wise, writing I think it's just familiar, familiarity. And um, and just the more we write, and the more we test ideas, and the more our ideas fail, and the more we piss about late at night when we're drunk, and kind of you know come up with silly things and 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 consider them as as genuine ideas, then. Then, then the better. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping our writing is just going to get better and better as we go on. Um, I certainly feel also that having 
having made our own work has really helped sharpen all of our writing because nothing sort of makes you take your writing more seriously than when you're kind of faced with the prospect of actually having to film it you know it's no it's no good being like oh well, the joke's not that great we'll we'll fix it further down the line you know if you are genuinely filming it at the end of the year um and you're genuinely producing it and you've got actors to play it um you you have to sharpen up that dialogue or or make that scene work or whatever so um i think the more we kind of self-produce and force ourselves to just make stuff um the the better and the sharper our writing will get i hope Yes, having an accountant present you with the budget sheet does rather focus. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's no use putting that kind of helicopter stunt at the end of your film when you realise <laughs> it's not going to be affordable. Um, at various points in your, your acting career, you have some ditch or terror brushed up against major television institutions, um, I think the principally of Doctor Who and then mm. I think the murderous racist in EastEnders. Uh, yes. I've... Yeah. Um, I mean, I was a homophobic spoken... racist. Sorry? A homophobic. Homophobic racist. racist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes, of course. So you know. Just, you know, you need to tick off all the boxes. Yeah. Um, I've spoken to a number of friends and colleagues who have, who've worked on major franchises or long-running mm -hmm. series about their experiences of being even a small part of the fabric mm -hmm. of, of, of something like that. How, how was that for you? Is it, is it possible to just treat that like any other job, or is there a bit of a weight of expectation that comes with it? Um, there's certainly, I mean, there's a huge, I remember walking onto the EastEnders set and it was the most extraordinary feeling because, you know, you suddenly realise that these characters quite literally live there. You know, I was like, oh, whose who's car is that? They're like, oh, that, that's Doc Cotton's car. You know, she's, of course she's got her character car. Mm -hmm. Whose house is that? That's Ian Beals. And, um, and, and there was something wonderful about just walking through those familiar market streets and sets and the square and the pub and everything um and then kind of being faced with with um you know the curtain being pulled back and realizing that the tricks and the like you know this is the bit where you go downstairs at, at phil mitchell's house and you realize the stairs just kind of are just this banister that goes into the floor and then you kind of like pretend to go down and then that's when they would cut and they'd go to a different studio um and i think i just found it um found it so fun it was a re you could just tell that you know the people that have been working there for 30 years not just the actors but the makeup staff and whatever and um and everyone's so friendly and up for a chat and everyone's you know trapped in this communal workspace i think it's like the closest to a kind of office job that you can get on on set uh, in that it is an institution and there's kind of hierarchies and in jokes and like everyone you know don't talk to her about that and don't do this or whatever uh and i did uh um what's his name is what's phil mitchell's name mcfadden oh steve mcfadden steve mcfadden so i did go up to him i thought you know come on i can't be on set with this guy without going up and introducing him um and we didn't have a scene together but my character did um my character knocked him out uh, as part of the kind of horrible kidnapping thing that i did um so i went up to him and i was like oh, hi steve my name's tom i'm playing this guy simon and just thought i'd say hello because um uh my uh i actually uh i actually knock you out in the in the script and he just looked at me and just went yeah that happens off screen <laughs> and that was kind of it <laughs> so we sort of shook hands and i left and i realized we didn't have a face-to-face -face scene and so i probably should probably shouldn't have approached that one but um but that was what that was really fun and um and it's you know it's extraordinary going on to those as you say these huge institutions because it's this you know massive in one in one sense it's a kind of tightly oiled machine and you are just this tiny cog into this huge thing that's just motoring every day six days a week um and uh and so you just kind of slot in and um uh, and that's great, but at the same time, there's kind of this, like I very almost um, walked away without realizing I had another scene to go because it's sort of, it's so big that it's almost chaotic and it's, you can kind of just get forgotten about because it's such a massive sort of machine going on. 
Um, and uh, luckily, I was kind of like halfway to leaving the leaving the, the studio, and someone tapped me on the shoulder and was like, you know, so you've still got this one really important scene. It's like the end of the episode. And I don't know what they would have done if I'd walked away. I mean, I think they maybe would have just like, you know, rewritten the the scene or something. Um, uh, a lot of the people that had been working there, the actors, you know, they they all knew the rules about, you know you don't turn your phone off, like you can be called in at any second, um, the scripts change any moment. I was there on set asking some of the regulars, you know, because we're filming all out sequence and they don't really give you the scripts until the day or maybe the day before. So I was asking the actors, you know, we've, um, so I was like, you know, so we've, we've kidnapped you in the back of this van. We're, um, we're clearly doing something dodgy. Do you know, um, do you know why we're doing it? <laughs> and, uh, and all the actors were like, no. We don't know. <laughs> like, we, we don't get told anything. They just sort of act the scene as it comes and then it all ties together in the edit and suddenly they realise what the storyline is going on. So the writers are very much king on those, on those kind of projects um, and the actors are, 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 are pawns just kind of like being told what to do. But it's funny how, I mean, I worked with a drama coach that, that did believe this, that you didn't actually need to know the, the bigger context of the whole story and the whole episodes and the whole play or whatever if you were given a scene and you knew what your intention was the sorry that's my baby um uh the the writing should be able to take you through it you know the the, the writer has scripted it such that the intentions are all there the context is all there if you just say the lines with the right um intention and the right sort of obstacle in your mind it will come out in the best possible way. And so it's a very simplified way of looking at acting. And I guess in a way it's sort of slightly demoralizing for, for how important it is to be an actor. But, um, but it, in some sense, it, it kind of, I, I actually enjoy the simplicity of that. Stepping away from performance, looking back at, at, at writing, um, what is it that that side of your work gives you that, that performing doesn't? And, and do you have a preferred process for writing? um well in answer to the first question yeah it's just it's control really um i think it's you know when i was just an actor um it's really hard getting out of bed every morning and and being like okay well my job today is to wait for the phone to ring and to um and to hope it does you know maybe read an acting book maybe go to a class or something but you're really powerless and that's that's obviously very stressful um whereas you know i've got a lot more work acting than i have writing but i feel so much more in control of writing i could you know if i've got a spare 20 minutes i can start a new film i can write down ideas i can have them kind of fizzing around in my head it feels like i am totally in control of that process there's still an element that you know i've still got to convince someone to take it on then convince someone to get the financing, convince someone to cast it right. It's a huge process. Um, it's not like you suddenly get the job and you're, and you're writing and you're making a film in the way that acting is. But, um, but as, a, as a process overall, you know, the idea that, that I can be the one that decides whether I'm busy or not um, is, is, just a, is just a huge relief. And, it's, and it can be inspiring as well when you, when you do feel like you are the only one motivating yourself and you can do that because you think your idea is good enough that it is worth your while spending that day writing this thing that you don't know is going to ever get made um that can be a really satisfying process um so yeah control i would say is the main reason why i think i prefer writing as a as a career and as a kind of um and as a I guess as, as something that fills my day. Um, and then what was the second question? The, Have you a preferred process when you're writing? Of writing. Um, well, when Tom and I write together, um, we uh, first, we, so we would come up with the basis of the, 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 the hook, the, the, the kind of inciting incident or whatever. Um, of the film or the TV show. And then we kind of flesh that out, build up the few main characters on a Google doc, just kind of throwing ideas out there, maybe watching some things that are relevant, 
um, maybe reading some stuff, finding, I don't know, the odd article that's relevant. Um, and that's kind of quite a fun sort of floaty process where we'll kind of dip in and out a bit when we're feeling like it. Um, and, um, and then we'll build, we'll, we'll build up, yeah, the characters, the kind of main hook of the show. Um, and then we'll just go into structuring and we'll do a very bare bones skeleton of, and I quite like to keep everything pretty structured Act one, act two, act three, got your twists at the right time. You've got your inciting incident. You've got your obstacles arriving at the right time. And, and, and you're always working towards that ending. That's going to be the, the final scene, the obligatory scene that's, 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 you know, there to, to justify the whole, the, the whole, Thing that you're watching um and so when we've got that structure written out we literally just go in and it is just line by line and i think this is quite rare for two writers to work in this way as, as far as i understand it most people do a draft send it back to the other writer write separate scenes um maybe write in the same room but kind of on different things whereas we literally work sort of line to line to line um taking it in turns to to man the keyboard essentially um, and we obviously used to do that in person, um, but since the lockdown, we've started working on Zoom. We were just working this morning online, um, and we've kind of discovered that it's a little bit more efficient actually working uh, working digitally than working in person. I think because there's fewer distractions, and it's easier to it's easier to just put it in the diary. It's easier to do a kind of regular burst of two hours a day rather than kind of one day when you're both free where you feel like you have to cram everything in it's easier to not get distracted by the place you know we work we used to work in cafes and you kind of end up just kind of chatting and then having brunch and then kind of like suddenly the day would be sort of floating away from us so uh so yeah so we're you know now the lockdown's lifted and we're both in the same city and everything but we're continuing to work over zoom so i think that's gonna work for us for a while um and then we will just write solidly until we get to the end, trying not to go back and perfect things until we've finished the first draft. Um, then once we finish that first draft, I like to sort of actually print it out um, to read through it again, to kind of give you that. Once you've printed it out, it sort of feels like a real script. It feels like it's something an actor might get or a director might get to read. And when you can really see it on the page again, you get that sense of like, Ooh, now that I see it printed, like, is that really worth having that scene there? And would I really want to budget a kind of moment like that when it's not actually that funny or whatever? And so I find it a lot easier to cut and edit things from a physically printed page. Um, and then we'll chat and then we'll go back and we'll just redraft and redraft and redraft. Um, and we kind of won't really, yeah, we won't really show it to anyone until we're really, really happy with it kind of start, start to finish. Um, so that's the process we do when we write. Um, and then when I'm writing on my own, I guess it's harder because, well, I tend to write things a lot quicker. So I'll get that first kind of vomit draft out very quickly. Um, but obviously without that other person to be kind of censoring and editing and taste testing as you're going, it tends to be a lot worse <laughs> when you first read it through. Um, and then the difficult part is, making notes for yourself as it were you know it's easier if it's two of you you kind of discuss and you can kind of look at it critically um but when it's just you what i try to do is as i write that first draft i have a notepad separately and if something strikes me i'll just write it on that notepad and just keep just keep going mm -hmm. um so you don't lose momentum but you can kind of keep a tab of things that are working and things that aren't and other ideas that might meet might mean restructuring the whole thing but you don't want to sort of get stuck into that kind of tangled web of just doing the first scene over and over again and you know dropping in new seed lines that are going to pay off later um so that's how i'll work on that one and then um and then another little trick which i've kind of just picked up and this is for the kind of latter stages of self-editing um and i picked this up off these two directors that i write with that i made a short film with um, but what we do is we go through every scene and we have a little kind of grid and a system for a, for a, um, 
what we'll what we'll have is we'll basically say does this scene have a narrative question at the end of the scene that will leave the audience wanting more right so at the end of that scene as an audience member i should be asking a specific question you know will this guy fall in love with her is is this party going to be a disaster um you know will they get away with this bank robbery or whatever and if your scene is not leaving any question like that then it, there's no reason for it um you can cut it and the other thing is if your narrative question is the same one after the other you know if you're um if you've got you know will he fall in love with her next scene will he fall in love with her again that's going to be a little bit boring for the audience so you might want to tweak that a bit and sort of you know will he fall in love with her i don't know um will his will his ex stop him from falling in love with her you know adding in that extra bit of narrative detail that's just going to keep us kind of intrigued all the way through um all the way through the film uh so that's a recent technique i've picked up and um i think works pretty well and actually now that tom and i are editing our feature film it's a it's also it's a system that works really well for the edit as well you know you can you can really if you're getting too close to the scenes and you're getting too familiar with the film you can really just ask yourself that question like does the scene need to be there is there something i am learning that's new that's seeding me with a question that i don't want to find out um so uh so yeah that's a little recent technique i've discovered um and it's all about i mean all these things are just about kind of it giving you some focus and structure to what you're doing because there's just nothing more daunting than looking at a blank page and, and you know not knowing where you're going to go but equally looking at a finished first draft and just not knowing how to start give yourself notes you know you have just touched on the fact that you have this new feature that's in post production mm. which um you and Tom have co-written and you've produced um Tell us about that, and, and, and is there a, a timeline for where and when we might expect to see it? Um, well, so, well, I'll take you, take you from the top. We wrote this film, um, when was it, two years ago. Um, we specifically wrote a film because we were a little bit jaded by writing treatments and pitches for TV um, series ideas. Um, and essentially the way that kind of works is, you know, you work it up with the production company. Maybe you get a little bit of money as an option on the, on the idea. You work up the script. This all takes, you know, three to four months. Then your producer pitches it to the commissioner. Then maybe three months after that, you get told, no, we're not going to go for it or whatever. And, and we were kind of in that cycle, you know, four or five years of kind of just really piling everything into these series ideas. And then, being told no, being told no. So the theory was, well, like, right, fuck it, let's write a very micro budget um, feature film all set in one house that we can just kind of like shoot on iPhones and just do and just take three weeks off and grab some actors and just, you know, make it guerrilla style. Um, so we came up with this concept, which is a kind of, it's a dark comedy about social paranoia. It's called All My Friends Hate Me. It's a guy's birthday. He's got his old best friends from uni throwing a party for him. And over the course of the weekend, uh, they all sort of slowly, one by one, turn against him. And he doesn't know whether this is because he kind of did something wrong at university and they're punishing him, or if um, he's just gone a bit paranoid because he hasn't really seen them in a while and he's got sort of slight anxiety, or if it's this sort of weird, sick joke that maybe was funny once at university but really doesn't feel funny now. Um, and obviously I don't want to ruin the ending, but it kind of builds to a big crescendo and you find out what it's all about. Um, so that was the setup. We wrote the script. We had a lot of fun writing characters we knew and wanted to send up. Um, and um, we gave it to our agents and we didn't think much of it, but we said, you know, at some point we're going to try and just shoot this. But, you know, it was a bit of a harebrained, harebrained um, pipe dream of an idea. Um, and uh, our agents sort of sent it around and told us six months later that it had gotten this thing called the Brit List, which is a sort of series of 
supposedly the the best kind of 20 unproduced scripts of that year it's it's to sort of help give exposure to writers that haven't had films made yet so we got on this brit list and we thought oh cool we could probably take this seriously now so we uh so we went around and we tried to get funding from various production companies and distributors and stuff um got so close to making something happen but on the whole when when some of these bigger companies take on a film they usually want to push it the way of i mean the easiest way to finance a film is you get a big star you actually increase the budget from being a micro budget 200 grand film to being a three million pound film you get kit harrington in it suddenly you've got a financeable film um and then you can make it you know several years down the line uh and we kind of kept hearing this and thinking, well, to be honest, that's not really, we made this because we wanted to make it quickly. We didn't make it so that it could be scaled up and could take longer and could be this other thing that was going to sort of you know, take forever. So we went down a slightly different route, micro budget, kind of crowdfunding. Um, and, uh, and we started shooting it in November um, and we attracted an awesome cast. Uh, for the film, um, no one was paid very much, but it was a real passion project for everyone. Um, and it was a three and a half week shoot in one house with seven cast members and 20 crew. And it was, I mean, at times it was like the best fun I've, I've ever had um, working. And um, it was a great vibe on set and everyone was kind of pitching in and putting that extra bit of energy and love into the work <clears throat> and hopefully that's all going to come through in the in the final in the final edit um but it is currently um oh by the way i should say there was a lot of talk last year about pushing the dates to march this year oh, so wow. <laughs> so the main the main thing to say is that we're very very lucky to have this film <laughs> in the can um and even luckier to be editing it during lockdown because the deal was always with the editor and the director you know please can you you know put as much effort into this as possible but we can't really pay you much money so if you ever get a big commercial through then obviously take the time off and do that and that's your your, your income and this is more of a sort of passion project thing anyway needless to say like it's been three months of no commercials happening so they've been laser focused on this edit uh and we're getting to a point where yeah tom and i are really happy with it the director's happy with it um there's going to be quite a sort of tense moment of committing to that final edit got to get it mixed and graded and stuff but um we should hopefully be releasing it this side of the year at the end of the year um and um yeah i don't know how or where it's going to end up because obviously we made it all on spec so you know traditionally we would go to a sales agent and they would take on the film and sell it to distributors all over the world and they take a cut and, you know whether whether that goes to cinemas or streamers or tv you don't know mm. um but things are a little bit different these days and you know that there is that option of trying to pitch direct to a streamer if that's potentially what you want to do um, obviously, usually we would have done a, a year's worth of film festivals, but that doesn't look like it's happening anytime soon. So um, we'll see. We'll wait till we've got the film um, and then we'll send it around and, and we'll just, you know, yeah, who, who knows? Who knows where it'll end up? But I hope it will be seen at some point. <laughs> uh, but whether in a cinema or on a TV screen, I don't know. All my friends like me and um, your can award winner man of the hour which um was just from that couple of years ago now isn't yeah it? so um that one we shot so that was my first kind of project i did on my own um again wrote a short film it was actually for a competition um which i never entered into because i realized it violated all of the con competition rules <laughs> the competition was for it was sponsored by um uh, some drinks brand and i realized that it sort of said like no characters could be drinking and no one could be drunk or whatever. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, but here I was, so I sat on this script that I'd written that was doing nothing. And I was actually acting at the time and I was going to the actors center and doing screen acting classes. And I started kind of gelling with these two directors that were running um, this class. And we had a chat afterwards and they put me in one of their 
tiny little short films. And I said, look, if you're looking to scale up and make a bigger short film, I've got this script, it's been sitting in my drawer, no one's read it. And they read it and, um, and they said, yeah, let's, let's try and do this. Um, and, you know, it's 17 minutes long, but it took about, yeah, a year of my life to get it, to get it going. A lot of pre-production, um, a lot of production because on that kind of budget, we were working with good cast members, but they were very busy with other projects. So we couldn't have this kind of dream of like block shooting six days in a row same place you know that's how we kind of did the feature but um this was shot sort of as it worked out about two days a month over four months or something and um you know we just got the final scene in time before our lead actress had her hair cut like a bob for some other job so like we were dicing with death but we got it shot in the end um again we were, we were really begging borrowing stealing for um our editors and our samics and, and whatever. So post-production took a long time, um, but eventually we got it together. We were all really proud of it. We, the first festival we pitched to was this, um, it's called the American Pavilion. It's at the Cannes Festival, but it's not the main short film award, um, which I was, wasn't gonna qualify for. Um, yeah, and, and, and it won the sort of main, the grand jury prize uh, at, that, at that tent um and that just gave us this extraordinary boost and then we got into other festivals we did a year's worth of festival screenings met a lot of people uh learned a lot on the circuit and then it's been picked up by a distributor and it's now on amazon prime and it's on shorts tv and it's in on various places all over the world it is so, it's well 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 worth watching it's extremely glossy production um, thanks very much yeah so we so we Oh, I was just going to say, we, I mean, it, it looks, uh, I mean, we shot it for £11,000 um, and it looks, yeah, I mean, three or four times that budget. So it just goes to show like, you know, if, if you've got enough passionate people behind something, you really can kind of achieve something professional with, with not a huge amount. I mean, obviously £11,000 is a lot of money, but in film terms, and I think compared to what we achieved, um, it was really quite quite minimal so um yeah i'm feeling yeah feeling very lucky and, and and proud of that one and i have to say had i not spent a year producing that um i think i would have imploded on the on the set of our feature film because, <laughs> i mean producing something in general is just you know an intensity beyond description but doing it on such a low budget um where you're essentially just asking for favors the whole time is deeply, deeply stressful. Um, and I think what I learned on that short film is essentially to not waste time getting stressed and essentially take each day as it comes. Um, because, you know, you might be worrying about the car driving scene on the last day, which is the most complex shoot, but actually that's a problem you'll solve on that day. Um, and right now you need to think about, I don't know, the, the dinner scene in there when and who's going to be sorting out the soup to keep it warm or whatever, you know, there's just endless trivialities and stuff to, to, to do. And you have to kind of live in the moment and just be comfortable with the chaos of it um, rather than try and fight it. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so those are my two, um, my two forays into the world of producing. Um, and I have to say, I, I am starting to enjoy it. <laughs> They do also both, as, as sort of in terms of their subjects, take a um, slightly acidic view of mm. friendships in the perhaps upper middle classes. Um, do you think that particularly chimes at the moment? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I talk about this with Tom sometimes, but I think, um, I don't know, I guess it's just a sort of projection of our own in our insecurities at our own groups of friends and our own um, social interactions. But I also think, um, yeah, this, I think there is something about that class of people that is kind of a little bit fake and a little bit sort of, um, uh, that invests a lot into kind of the slightly macho jokey kind of, um, 
you know, I'm not affected by this because I can play this role in this situation and I can like, you know, be fake in this way and you can be fake in that way. Um, and there's something sort of, I don't know, there's some kind of system to it that uh, I think we get slightly intrigued by. Um, but yeah, I suppose it's not a very kind of benevolent view of human nature, but maybe we're just, maybe we're just, I don't know. Tom thinks sometimes that we've been we've been emotionally spoiled, and so we need to kind of like tear all that down and see, you know, and see the kind of horror that's underneath it. But I don't know, I don't know where it comes from. In addition um, to, to to all of that, you have in the last few years done some incredible work in support of access all areas theatre, mm. um, which for anyone who's unaware of their work creates work with artists who live with a variety of disabilities. And you have, in fact, am I right in saying, help form a seed company from within that organisation? Yeah, so, um, yeah, Access All Areas is an incredible um, theatre company that works with people with uh, disabilities, and they put on extraordinary shows. If anyone gets the chance to see them, they're, they're, they're insane. Um, and they have a wonderful creative director who's just a bit of a visionary, really. But um, but what they did, which I thought was was so awesome, is they received a lot of national lottery funding and as part of i mean they could have just kind of kept that money and used it for the next show or whatever but instead they set up these three sort of seed theater companies and i had already been volunteering with access all areas for three years just doing a thursday here and there doing workshops with some of the actors and sometimes talking about um getting agents and doing auditions and stuff and giving a sort of actor's perspective um, but really just to be honest having a lot of fun myself and um, there's just so many great people there um, and uh, I was assigned to this little theatre group three actors um, and uh, we had a bit of funding and we had a sort of R&B week at the Lyric Hammersmith um, and we had a week to create something um, and show it to prospective producers at the end of the week so it was amazing it was such an awesome thing to do the week went really well um we somehow did create something in a week that we were actually really proud of um and we did get a producer and we ended up going to edinburgh and performing at the vaults and stuff like that um but it was a it was a really fascinating um and i think kind of just a really original uh workshopping process because what this director did um called paloma oakenfold which was so brilliant she came in and, and we basically just did a workshop about confidence um talking about what makes us confident um what makes us shy um why the theater was this kind of sort of vehicle for confidence which some people find to be an odd idea because i guess for some people it's their idea of a nightmare being on stage in front of people but for some of us, you know, there is something about escaping on stage and being someone else. Um, and um, certainly for these three actors who can be very shy and introverted in real life, um, when they're given the chance to improvise and create characters and come on stage, it's just so extrovert and funny and loud. And, and what we started to notice was that as they workshopped these characters for the stage, the characters seem to kind of embody the antithesis of some of their inner insecurities. So we've got this great actress called Kirsty, um, who's got sort of mild cerebral palsy and is very shy and quiet um, and has kind of spent a lot of her life saying sorry and kind of feeling like, you know, she doesn't deserve to be heard. This is all sort of her words, really. Um, uh, you know, we've actually literally had to ban her from saying the word sorry because she says it so instinctively. Um, but her character on stage is this kind of drug dealing psychopath who comes out and like messes with the audience and swears and says these smutty jokes. And, um, and she's just absolutely electric in, in this character. So um, the same thing was uh, Lee, who's kind of, um, again, very introverted and shy and um, worried that he doesn't sort of date enough. Um, but his character is this kind of extraordinary superhero called Captain Everyman, um, catchphrase, every man for himself. 
uh, and he's just permanently flirting with the ladies in the crowd and taking them on dates. Then Zara, who's got uh, something called charge syndrome, and is very kind of um, particular and self-deprecating um, and asexual. Um, but her character is this kind of like sex crazed diva from the 50s um, who comes out and is just really inappropriate with all the people from the audience. Um, so, so slowly we could see the kind of kernels of this show forming that was all about taking their inner shy selves, invading a theater space um, and kind of becoming different characters in order to kind of overcome these preconceptions of disabilities. So the setup is that you're about to watch The Merchant of Venice with uh, Ian McKellen. I know there's an announcement, so saying Ian's late, he's in the bath, sorry. Just, you know, it'll be five minutes. Um, uh, that gives our actors the time to invade the space, steal some costumes and start entertaining the audience. And so we end up watching their show instead. Um, and then there's a sort of final message at the end of the show, um, which is when they're told to take their costumes off. Um, and uh, it feels like it's going to be quite a sad moment because they can no longer be these characters. But the twist is that we realise that actually the real superheroes, the real amazing people are the the, the people they are themselves, not these characters they play on stage. Um, and if only society could kind of give them more breathing space to be these people, um, then they wouldn't have so many of these kind of insecurities and um, uh, and sort of inhibitions to to the to the to, to those elements of their life. Um, so it's a show we're really proud of. We really sadly had this big Soho theatre run lined up for May this year. Yeah. Um, so that that was just tragic because that was going to be the big launching of, of the, the sketch group, Bareface. Sadly, that didn't happen, but we are now trying to um, trying to get some Arts Council funding to film something related to this, this theatre group um, because I think it's going to be a while before they're going to feel comfortable. They're quite high risk, some of them, and before they feel comfortable going out and performing mm. in theatres, even if it does start opening up next year. So... We're going to try and just film something, you know, one space, two days, um, form a little bubble and maybe try and project that in, in, in theatres as our kind of launch. Um, so we'll see. But they're, they're so talented um, and like so creative and fun to work with. And um, yeah, it's just been a joy writing with them and, and coming up with, um, with all these crazy ideas that they do. Well, we hope that that will all come good. And, yeah. Uh, look forward to hearing, and obviously we'll uh, be more than happy to help share any further information. That yes, about that. great. Um, what do you want to achieve that you haven't achieved yet? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I'd like to achieve... Um, I mean, I think I'd like, I, I think I'd just like to make a slightly bigger budget film. <laughs> I'd like to make, I'd like to do what we did before Christmas. Um, and, uh, with it, with a budget that allowed us to be a little nicer and more generous with our time to people. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I hope that one day we'll, we'll get that chance. Um, and then the other thing, really, I, I would I would just love to make a series with these guys, these um, with Bareface Theatre, the um, our, our disabled theatre company, um, because I think they are just totally electric on screen. They're extraordinary, unique. It's like I think it could be this kind of genre busting, groundbreaking new new form of um, of content. Um, so I'm putting a lot of energy to try and get this little pilot over the line um so that would be hugely satisfying um and um yeah i mean I, i'm just very lucky i think you know to be honest i think not long ago i did have very strict ambitions to be somewhere and be doing something by this date and i feel like now i'm just very happy for doing what i'm doing you know i'm just so lucky to be able to make films and write films and work with talented people and and live off it and survive off it so i i don't really um feel like i'm, I'm asking for too much more than that i just i guess i just hope it just continues that's of course a major recent addition in your own private life as well 
Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's been so so mad having um, having a child now. I have to kind of remind myself of that every now and then. Um, but uh, obviously, that's been the most wonderful thing to happen, and um, it's been, to be honest, I, I was really worried that you know it was going to change everything, and I wasn't going to be able to focus enough on work or see enough people or whatever, and that would just be a kind of like a sacrifice that you had to deal with. But if I'm honest, it's kind of, it's made me work more efficiently. Um, it's made me slow down my life a bit. Um, I, I actually feel kind of healthier and happier as a result of it, which I think I maybe wasn't expecting to feel. So, um, so again, been really, really lucky to have, to have her. And, um, and I feel guilty because it's kind of made this year slightly magical for me whilst it's been <laughs> pretty depressing for everyone else. <laughs> Well, as she comes into the world, one of the people who went out of it earlier this year was James Lipton of Inside the Actors Studio in uh, New York. Uh, he would, uh, before he'd take a couple of questions from the floor, uh, had the same 10 questions that he asked every single God. guest. Which, okay. Uh, I've been asking everyone here. Okay. Um, we'll just fire through. What's your favourite word? Favourite word? Um, eglantine is a personal favourite. Um, and your least favourite word? Moist. <laughs> uh, what, this is how he phrased it, answer it however you like, what turns you on? What turns me on? Um, oh God. Um, <sighs> pass. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> don't want to share that. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that particularly turns you off? um what do i not like i don't like um i don't like um i don't like jealousy what sound or noise do you love mm. um well, I mean, this is quite niche, but like opening a tennis ball can. And what sound of noise do you hate? Um, hmm. What would I say? Uh, the sound of someone texting. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favourite swear word? Uh, prick, probably, if that's a swear word. We'll take it for the <laughs> what what profession other than those you already do would you like to attempt? Um <laughs> I I did one of those, you know, what job you're gonna be tests when I was eighteen and it came out with um you should be either an actor or an archaeologist. <laughs> so I feel like in honor of that I should probably say archaeology <laughs> and what profession would you absolutely never want to attempt um well i feel I, I my dad's a lawyer so i feel like if i was a lawyer that would be that would be admitting defeat <laughs> uh whatever your beliefs may be in life if when your time comes you wake up the far side and discover heaven exists what would you like to hear said to you on arrival <clears throat> uh good job kid <laughs> We've had a couple of questions thrown our way. Um, George from Chiswick says he was privileged enough to see you and Tom Stoughton in Simon Dormandy's production of Waiting for Goldo a few years oh, ago, yeah. Arcola. Um, how did you, in fact, so was I, George, um, that was, um, it was quite, quite the show. How did you work to make what is a very iconic show, which is very heavily restricted, mm. fresh? Somehow we got away with it. I don't know. But um, the central premise of how we were going to freshen it up um which i think worked for about 90 percent of the play was let's play this for real what if we really were two abandoned homeless guys that had kind of lost their sense of time and space um, and that was our justification for being young because actually the kind of uh trope of like the old you know, vagrant in their 80s is kind of not really something you see so much anymore, sadly, because I think there's a sort of lower life expectancy of people that live 
um, on the streets. So the idea was, you know, ha can we kind of play this like we really are two homeless guys who have just don't know what time of year it is, don't know where they are, but have something that they're hoping for and that they're waiting for. Um, and I think I'm really, and I'm just really, I'm really proud we tried to do that. We tried to do something different. As you say, it's impossible to kind of, uh, from any of Beckett's um, uh, sort of restrictions on the play, but um, they, they let us do it. And I think it was a great way to get a lot of younger people involved in, in Beckett. Um, and I think it's just a reminder that, uh, you know, that there had just been the McKellen Stewart sort of world renowned version. But I, I hope at the very least it was just a reminder that, you know, you, you can do this thing differently. And, you know, one day it will be out of copyright and everyone will be doing it differently. So it kind of, to me, it feels a bit odd that, that it's so heavily restricted. Um, and I think all pieces of art and theatre and whatever should be reinterpreted and reworked um, forever. Laura from Runcorn asks, would you, if you were to go back to acting, would you consider a long-term role in a major series or do you prefer to have more variety? Um, yeah, I, I definitely would. I mean, I think I, um, yeah, I, I think, I think regularity of, of acting work is, is the only thing I'd need to, <laughs> to go back. I think that's why I've taken on so much writing and producing is just that. You know, the, the hard part of acting is not actually doing it. It's, it's the in-between time. It's mm. waiting for the next job and it's keeping your head space somewhere where you're confident and motivated and ready to take the next thing on. So, yeah, um, if you've got a regular part for me in a series, bring it on. <laughs> uh, finally, Sayra from Bristol um, says, as both an actor and a writer, who are the actors, actor or actors or writers that you most look up to? Um... Well, recently, I think um, Elizabeth Moss, I'm slightly obsessed with at the moment. I think she's apps. She's just so intense and kind of, I don't know, I could watch her, could see like the whole scene in her eyes sometimes just in one look. So I think, I think she's absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, in terms of writers, um, who do I love? I mean... Um, uh, I'm gonna. Is it uh, which of the Peep Show guys is right in succession? I can't remember. Is it Sam Bain or Jesse Armstrong? Oh, I can't remember. Whichever one is writing succession, I'm really into their writing at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Palmer, thank you very much indeed. For thank you so much, buddy. <laughs>